I am joined now by Israel's ambassador to Canada. Mr. Ambassador, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. So perhaps let's just start out at a time when practically the entirety of the world has their eyes set on the situation in Israel right now, obviously a devastating situation. You yourself are the ambassador to Canada. What can countries like Canada uh, or even the United States, countries who economically are in a position where they can help, what should they be doing to assist the people of Israel? Uh, perhaps let's talk a little bit about what is actually happening in Israel right now, because there are a lot of confusing reports and uh, a lot of events that are taking place. Um, I think what is unfolding is that at the moment there is a terrorist organization called Hamas, uh, that is comprised of uh, militants that are armed and are trained uh, and have weapons, have uh, bombs and so on. They have been uh, saying for quite a while they want to destroy and annihilate the state of Israel. They live in the Gaza Strip, which is uh, a strip, a very small stretch of land which is near Israel, borders with Israel. There are no Israelis there. And they believe that they should annihilate the state of Israel. They are supported by a state called Iran. Iran is a very is a very big and, and powerful state in the Middle East that provides them with arms and training and gives them directions what to do. And so at, um, at actually at dawn this morning, they started to attack Israel. They penetrated the border. They shot rockets into Israel, thousands of them at the same time. It's incredible to see what that means shooting thousands of rockets but just imagine that it's like a, um i don't know it's a, a, like new year's uh firecrackers but then it's all bombs that really fall into it on the ground and explode and take, make a lot of damage and kill people so the uh the terrorists of the hamas shoot into israel and at the same time penetrate those uh, villages and communities that are near the border they penetrated to kill people, to hijack people, and to uh, hold them or to hold them hostage in their place. And uh, from this morning up until now, we know that there are at least 200 casualties, over a thousand people wounded, and we don't know how many have been abducted into the Gaza Strip, an area that is outside the borders of Israel. So when this happened, uh, of course, Israel's military responded, and they are fighting against those terrorists, and they are fighting in different communities, and they will also uh, chase those terrorists into the Gaza Strip, most probably. But what is important to note is that countries around the world, like Canada, have immediately expressed solidarity with Israel and uh, said a few things. One is Israel has a right to defend itself. That's a very important issue because when another country attacks, one country attacks another, that's one thing. Here we have a terrorist organization that lives on a territory. It's not a state. Gaza Strip is not a state. Uh, so Canada, the US, many European countries said very clearly Israel, Israel has the right to uh, defend itself. Second is they also express solidarity with Israeli uh, people who are suffering right now, the wounded and the dead and the abducted and all of that. So uh, this is something that is very important for us. And if you ask what else can be done, it's not so much in the economical area. It is more in terms of solidarity, of supporting the people, supporting children, young people, you know, that among those who've been abduct abducted also are full families, whole families. So a kid uh, asked his mother, the Hamas terrorist actually published a video that says, a kid asks his mother, what is happening right now? And she tells him, we are being abducted. And he's perplexed. He just doesn't understand what is going on. So in this case, I think what is important for Israel is to have solidarity from fellow people around the world. And at a time when the question is obviously about the people who are being impacted by these actions, the people who are obviously living in Israel, what can be done to keep the number of casualties to a minimum? And specifically when looking at potentially, you know, Canadians who might be on the ground in Israel or or people whose safety is perhaps in jeopardy right now, what can be done to 
um, keep them as safe as possible? I mean, which is, I guess, kind of a rhetorical question, given the fact that really at, you know, when a country is at a state of war, it, it is obviously very difficult to ensure the safety of people. It's true. It's not a rhetorical question. I think it's a very good one because actually it speaks to the fact that people have to listen to the uh, emergency uh, responders. The first responders have to abide by the uh, regulations of the security forces. And uh, in Israel, we've also come to develop a very unique invention, and that is called a safe room. So in each house in Israel, we have each house, each apartment has actually one room that is built from concrete with a very solid door, like a like a safe door, and the window can be closed with a very heavy uh, lid as well, and so people can stay in there when rockets are being fired. So if a rocket hits a building, because this concrete is very strong, they are protected inside. So this kind of rooms have saved hundreds and hundreds of people's lives. And so uh, when something happens, people go immediately to the safe room. They lock themselves up inside. They have water and radio and, and, and internet and everything inside. So there's, but they're safe. Second is by, by, the, by, by the instructions and all of that. And, and the third really is to uh, listen and to be updated what is happening in the news. So follow the news and understand what's going on. And what comes next when we look at, I mean, even if we look at other wars that have been going on for, you know, a lengthy period of time, the war between Russia and Ukraine, obviously, when it was kind of first taking place in kind of the first days of the war, we very much saw it kind of front and center on the front page of newspapers and in the news. But but now it kind of just seems as if, unfortunately, it's it's a daily thing that is taking place. So how can as you mentioned, people continue to express solidarity during such a challenging time. And how can you know we ensure that such a tragic situation is not actually going to be forgotten? So that's a very important question because the, a lot of people ask themselves, where do we go from here? Let's say that there are two options. One is that situation escalates and the other one is that the situation really calms. Uh, when it comes, everybody's happy because there will be less fighting and so on. But we know that those terrorists are still there. They have their weapons, they have their means to use them, and they have the motivation to use them. So a responsible state will have to act against them to prevent them from using the weapons against its population and against its territory. So what we can look at, I think, at the moment is that Israel is going to start uh, uh, some kind of an operation to eradicate this kind of uh, extremism, of this terrorist nest, to fight them, because it's not the population. We have to remember, in the Gaza Strip, there are a lot of Palestinians, about a million of them, who just want to live their daily lives. And so Israel tries to support them, allow them to come to work in Israel, trade with Israel, import goods from Israel, have uh, energy projects with them, all kinds of things. A small minority among them are these terrorists. So those terrorists need to be fought against. And this is what's going to happen. There's going to be a fight against these terrorists, which are a small group among this whole population of the Gaza Strip. Hopefully, this will end very quickly. I hope so, but it's hard to tell, of course. And just lastly here, I, I think kind of a, a nice way to end off our conversation. I mean, you've mentioned solidarity a number of times at a time when, you know, people here in Canada, for example, are looking to the situation. They're wondering what they can do to help um, people from around the world. What can, you know, someone do to help express that level of solidarity towards Israel when they are at a time of war? Uh, one can, for example, reach out to people of his age group of uh, uh, another school or uh, um, sort of a youth organization or, you know, people who do, who have the same occupation as, as they have and just reach out to them and tell them, hi, I'm from Canada. I'm wa following what's happening. It's in the news. It's horrible. Uh, I sympathize and I hope this is, this will be over soon. Uh, I think this is really helpful. I mean, you don't have to say if somebody is wrong or right. You just want it to be, to out of this horrible situation. Uh, so this is kind of a, a support that is important. But also it's important to think about the day after. 
to try and help to rebuild the society, to rebuild houses, to rebuild uh, connections. And um, uh, I think that through these kind of hard times, very often, very good friendship and lasting friendship uh, develop. So it's really something that should be uh, encouraged, I think. All right, we'll leave our conversation there. Israel's ambassador to Canada. Ambassador, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you for having me.